Hi everyone, this is Mr. Neil Writer here, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. So this video is a compilation of three procedures which all primarily use mechanical instruments to remove the wax. Uh, when we say mechanical instruments, we mean non-suction and non-irrigation, so no water. So although I'm using a suction to start off this procedure, it was very apparent immediately almost that that is not going to be removed just by using suction. The wax plug was um, very dry, very embedded, and it's this is really, really deep in there. It's lodged beyond the isthmus. Now, typically, I try and resist the urge of using mechanical instruments like hooks and scoops and force, uh, well, not so much forceps, but hooks and scoops, so jobs and horns, when it's the wax is in the inner two thirds. That's because if we come in contact with the bony part of the ear canal, which is the inner two thirds, it can be very sensitive and uncomfortable for the patient. There was a, the slightest of openings here, so I tried to get the hook and behind it, but it was just too lodged. Um, fortunately, the forceps came to the rescue. Even then, it was quite tricky. You can see the skin adhesions at the bottom that um, were adhering itself, not only to the, um, to the wax plug, but also to the surface of the ear canal. And it serves like a double-sided sticky tape, this dead keratin. And it can make it really, really tricky to um, extract the wax and detach it from the canal wall. So I brought this plug of dry wax and skin out of the isthmus. It was, it was right up against the eardrum. Just using the hook now to, to for, um, bring, out it, bring it out from the ear canal. You can just see how dry that is. So the patient has got a bit of eczema of the ear canal, the tidus externa. There's the eardrum. You can see the dip with the ear canal. It goes up and down and it got trapped there. So this is um, patient two. Now, this patient's got a, a dry plug of um, wax. It's quite aged. You can see by the colour, it's oxidised. It's near the entrance. It's a slight opening at the roof. So I'm going in with a, a Jobson horn. I think with this patient, they've got... Uh, a mastoid cavity and we purposely try to avoid suction wherever possible because the patient suffers from the chloric effect because of their mastoid cavity. So their mastoid cavity is what we call a modified r radical um, mastoid cavity. They previously um, had a cholesteratoma, so the cholesteratoma is a very dangerous, almost life-threatening infection of the attic region of the eardrum where the eardrum can get sucked in and it creates a pocket a cave um, and then you can get dead skin that sort of migrating out of the ear it gets trapped in that pocket and the skin can then get infected and grow further it can grow into the middle ear um, and upwards towards the brain uh, it can lead to a brain abscess and uh, meningitis so what the surgeon did they had to get access into the middle ear and this um, cholesterol had grown into the mastoid bone around the back of the eardrum. So they had to chisel out the bone um, of the ear canal. You can see top right there. So that's the patient, patient's attic region. They had to s literally scrape out the bone and then remove all that cholesterol that was there, that dead skin. And then they positioned, um, they, when they put the eardrum back on, um, so when they only get access to the middle ear, they lift the eardrum, um, almost like a door, they, they, they dissect it, lift it up, a flat, create a flap, chisel out all the bone, get access, the reason for the chiseling out the bone is to get access to that cholesterol remove all the cholesterol and then they reposition the eardrum back on, and sometimes what they do, um, the, the eardrum itself, it can then rest up against the vestibular organ, which is a semicircular canal, which is um, in the inner ear, but the, the horizontal semicircular canal. So there's three semicircular canals at different angles, different planes, which work in tandem to um, help you with your balance. And because, uh, so the horizontal one is protruding outwards, it's more lateral, sometimes called the lateral semicircular canal. Uh, it hasn't got the bone then any longer to protect it, so it's more susceptible to temperature change. And when we suction, it reduces the temperature, which then can inhibit the organ of balance, which then sends um, wrong information to the brain, and the brain thinks you're moving and you're not, and you, it's what we call the caloric effect, and you can get dizzy vertigo. So 
we think on the left day in particular, we, so the first day, we, this is the same patient, this is a stair right, so you can see there's no mastoid cavity there. But again, just use the Jobson horn, managed to remove all this um, wax laterally. But in particular, the left ear, um, they've had uh, cases in the past where they've had suction being performed and they've felt very faint, uh, nauseous, and um, they suffer from violent vertigo. It's short lasting, but it was very off putting, the patient advised. So this is patient two, I think we're almost finished there. So there is some um, lateral wax on the posterior canal wall. Now, I did ask the patient, if I remember correctly, if they've been using cotton birds, because it, to me it looks like some cotton wool fibres are stuck to this. The patient says no, so it could alternatively be a bit of a fungal infection um, you can get fungal um, the, the, the stems of fibers look like cotton wool fibers then you can sometimes get spores developing um, so we're going to keep an eye on that and if it is a bit of fungal infection the patient can use some canister near drops to assist you can see how we're just using the jobs and horn just to gently now because on the cartilaginous portion we can apply some pressure it doesn't mean we want to be overly aggressive here so we don't want to um, bruise or make the canal wall tender in any way we're just making contact with it and then rotating the jobson horn to just detach it from the canal wall and in a minute you'll see the third and final patient so that's the patient's eardrum nice and healthy this is patient three, um, just started off with suction, just at the entrance. Now their ear temperature is quite uh, higher uh, than usual, which caused a bit of misting initially of the lens. Um, I soon realized suction's not gonna be the right tool. Um, so using an ear hook, and we're trying to get in and behind this dry piece of wax, so it's just, there's a flake of skin there as well. The patient's got a very narrow slit ear canal, you can see everyone's ear canals, or most people's ear canals, it's oval shaped, so the height is greater than the width. In this patient's ear, I would say there's a, a, the height is significantly more greater than the width, it's more elongated, so it's a lot more narrow, which makes it more tricky, and again, I want to avoid uh, if possible, inserting the hook into the bony part of the ear canal, but there's a bit of a gap um, anteriorly and also to the roof. So I did attempt to get in and behind, just gone back in with the suction bed to see if I can bring this a bit forwards. I think in a moment I'm gonna use some forceps to extract it a bit outward laterally and then use the, um, the hook in, in, in combination. Whilst you're watching that, I'll just answer some of the questions from yesterday's video. Someone wanted to know, when hairs are plucked from the ear, if it's uncomfortable or painful. Uh, patients tolerate it really, really well. It's a little, probably sharp pinch, but that's it. I've never had anyone really complain that it's uncomfortable and to the point where I need to stop. Uh, another question was about the cost of these um, instruments because they're single use. In terms of um, what we charge for the procedure, it's a very, very small cost. So. Um, I can't tell you exactly because there's something uh, for each one will be there for a while, but they're very cost effective, these single use instruments. Someone else wanted to know uh, what software I use to edit my videos. I used to do it all on the desktop. I used to use um, quite an expensive video, video editing suite, Coral, but it was taking so much time transferring uh, the video from my uh, iClearscape to the desktop and then editing it and then rendering it and I'm now just using my iPhone. I've got an app and so there's some bits that, so they may not be the most professional videos in the world, but it's just so much more easier for me. Um, I was finally, I was spending a lot of hours at the clinic after work editing videos on my desktop. The time was not a very time efficient way of doing it. With this on my phone, I can do it at home now as well. And it, the suite itself, I mean, the software I'm using, the app, it's um, it's quite good actually. It's very uh, user friendly, and I can narrate. So I'm talking into my iPhone right now whilst I'm doing this video. 
Someone asked whether we prescribe drops because the patient in the last video, once we removed that really dry plug of wax, it was a bit red. That's just normal, um, sort of see, the ear's got some, uh, we've detached a plug of wax from the ear, the canal wall, so it naturally it'd be a bit red. Uh, don't need, there doesn't need any drops whatsoever, that will just settle uh, uh, within a day or so. I'll just quickly come back to the video. So I've removed that plug, eardrum's nice and healthy, it's visible in the distance, and now just using the hook, um, so not the pointed bit, but the edge of the hook, the, the, where the, L, um, the 90 degree bend is, to almost chisel out this wax on the cartilaginous portion to remove it, some dry skin there. And I'm just using going back with a suction to help me with that. There was another question about the patient in the last video, because they had a narrow ear, does that mean that they'll have to get the wax removed more frequently? It's quite possible when you've got narrower ears, um, it's more likely. The, the rate of migration of the skin is the same, but the wax can get trapped because the narrows around the bends and twists. Um, someone else wanted to know whether um, if they wear earplugs in the ear and they've got wax, whether it can push it further in. Yes, it can, fortunately. So um, if you are a waxy person, and you suffer from wax buildup in the ear. Anything that goes in your ear can impact it further in the ear. Someone asked a really good question is whether I've made mistakes and learned from mistakes. Yeah, we all make mistakes. Um, no one's perfect. And uh, when I'm training my clear wax delegates, I do. Uh, that's where I can teach them better because through my own um, mistakes and mishaps, I can pass on that knowledge. And by watching these videos back as well, I can always evaluate myself um, see what I could do better. So it's part of these videos that I do is also educational for myself to reflect upon the procedures I've performed and learn from that. I think someone wanted to know if you've got a narrow ear and you sleep on that ear, will that affect the migration? No, so the migration to the skin will be the same. It's just um, obviously sleeping on that ear can help in a way because the gravity uh, will assist the, the wax coming out uh, as the skin migrates. But again, it's all to do with the shape and size of the ear. Um, so I wanted to know about autoclaving the, the suction probes. Uh, they're, they're, they're single use because they've got aluminum, the internal um, obviously cylinder where the, the wax is sucked up. So when you've got a lumen device like that, they're typically single use because it's very, very hard to fully clean the inside of that, that lumen, the, the, the hole that runs through the suction probe. Someone asked about the function of these hairs and the importance they say, and I kind of I think they answered their own question. They say so, um, the hairs in the nose, the ears, they're, they're your first line of defense. So, you're part of your immune system, the innate immune system, the first line of defense. They trap any debris and um, particles that enter in the ear, and so they filtrate the air as well. Um, I think they took. So I got confused. So we've got little microscopic um, stereocilia, which is hair cells in the organ of hearing. So that's not the same hairs as at the entrance of the ear canal. And they can get damaged um, to noise exposure or head trauma or medication or various reasons, but most typically age-related hearing loss. And it's those little hair cells that produce an electrical signal in response to sound, which then is sent to the brain and we perceive that sound. Another question was asking whether it's common for the ear anatomy from, from the left and right ear to be slightly different. No, I would say that's quite common. You get a general um, similarities, but it's never exactly the same. It's like your left and right foot. Uh, I think I read some article as well. If you, uh, if you have a photo of yourself and put a, um, get a, a line in the middle, um, if you then closely look at your left and right side of the face, there is some asymmetries there. And I think there was sort of someone was doing it with some famous movie stars and they did this line down the centre of their face and then they copied and pasted and uh, rotated one side of the head so it fitted the other side. So both sides of the hair, one side of the head was um, reflective on the other side, if that makes sense. It's almost like a, heart, like a mirror in the middle of your face. And the person looked completely different. So, um, so yeah, there's always uh, going to be asymmilarities between ears, like other parts of the body. Someone asked um, why others advocate the use of water in the ear to remove ear wax. If I can shed any light on it, if I'm honest, I can't. Probably going to have to ask those people that are doing it. Uh, water, speak to uh, any ENT as well. Uh, water is the arch enemy of the ear. Um, it, the less water uh, opportunity water t gets into the ear, the less likely it is to uh, arise uh, and cause uh, an ear infection. Someone uh, made uh, just a comment about 
the focus and clarity of the other video and they wondered whether it was the hairs that was causing causing that so the video was not out of focus yeah it was just when you've got a narrow ear canal the wax is right in, right in front of you so it's quite lateral you've got these hairs there so you, you, naturally you're not going to get the clearest of images and i think i did mention that in my video but it's not affecting me whereby i can't remove that wax there are certain cases where there's so much hair there where it's very difficult to see where i just i do have to use some forceps and pluck some of those hairs but um, so i hope that answers that and i think the final question was uh, whether this particular patient on the last video they they had come before and the question was whether we have a specific time frame um it's a matter of like a pre-management phase so we we remove the wax before it becomes an issue yeah with that patient i think i can't remember but we looked at the the diary and we we analyzed the last time they came and we asked them to come a bit more frequently that does vary from individual to individual some people have to come every three or four months some people it's years so i always recommend if you are a waxy person and just say every two years your ears get completely blocked to the point you can't hear, I would just advise getting it removed every 18 months. For most people, it is like clockwork. Um, it's uh, almost like a perennial thing every year. Or You'll be able to gorge the time frame. I mean, you do sometimes get variation. Sometimes people could just have to get it done every year, but on a one-off occasion, for some whatever reason, it, within six months, for example, it comes back. So it is an individual thing. I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. And I think I've got through all the questions there. Take care. I shall speak to you soon.